Welcome everybody to the Alternative Sports Show, powered by Verge Magazine. I'm Matt Connell, and I'm so happy to say that, look, we've, we've got a pretty solid guest on this week's episode. Nick DeVries, 2021 Formula E world champion, Mercedes EQ team. Good sir. It's not bad to be you, is it? Thank you. Uh, well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be me. I wouldn't want to be anyone else, so yes. Are you, you know, we're, we're here today to talk, of course, of Formula E Unplugged, but I thought we need to set the foundation, set the story, and maybe for those that haven't been tuned into the Formula E season, understand um, kind of what we're looking forward to in this series. Now, of course, for yourself, it was a very, it was an unpredictable season, wasn't it? It there was roller coasters, left, right, and center. And I think, you know, after the Berlin race, the second Berlin race where you won that championship, the decider, um, you were very open and honest about how you felt about, you know, that it was almost like a lottery in a sense. Do you feel now a few months removed, maybe more comfortable with the idea that now you are world champion and it has sunk in? Um, I do a little bit. Uh, of course, yeah, I, I have been very uh, open, honest, and I think also very humble in, um, yeah, describing my feelings post Berlin because I really felt like, um, kind of the fortune chose us to to win the championship, and it was unpredictable, random at times, and a roller coaster for everybody. But ultimately, when I take a step back and reflect on our season, uh, I'm still uh, comfortable to say that we, you know, we we deserve the championship. We we've been leading majority of the championship, and we put ourselves in a position to to capitalize on. Uh, others' mistakes, and on top of that, you know, many or often many people look at the last race and say, you know, the championship is decided in Berlin race two. But effectively, if you look at the whole season, each race um, gives the same same amount of points. So you could argue if the season ended in London, then the, the feeling maybe would have been slightly different. Or if Saudi was not the first round but the last round, then you know, it was different too. So ultimately, I think uh, the team really deserved this because uh, I believe we hit the championship um, very well prepared and uh, we showed that in, in Saudi. We obviously had globally a very competitive start of the season and then we had a phase wherein we probably struggled a bit more, which I think was partly um, due to our own mistakes and, and, and sometimes lack of competitiveness, but it was also hugely influenced by the qualifying groups. Um, so if you all take it in account, I think no one would actually say that it was undeserved. We do acknowledge the, the, the luck that came into play on uh, Berlin race two, but actually if you look at, if you take a step back and look at the whole picture, I think, um, yeah, we were the champions. Although I will admit that my euphoric feeling um, lasted, uh, unfortunately, not very long because obviously I went to Le Mans and then I was busy with other things. But I, I uh, yeah, I'm comfortable to look back and say, yeah, we won this this year. But um, now our minds are already uh, in 2022. Well, you know, I think the way your season kind of panned out works very well for this 15 episode series, with, you know, 15 minute episodes as well. Because of course, like you said, you know, you, you you won the opening race, a lot of drama in the middle. Of course, Valencia was crazy, London double podiums, and you know, you ended the season as world champion. So as far as your kind of narrative, it's going to be very exciting to watch. One thing I always wanted to ask um racing drivers, um, you kind of have shades of Lewis Hamilton in the sense that, you know, where you won your respective championships, like Lewis in doing Brazil um 2008, you know, he he didn't finish on the podium, but finished as world champion. So for yourself, of course, um, you know, the way you finish your race, um, not making it to the podium, but being world champion, how strange was that for you as an emotion? Like, how do you kind of calculate that? Because you're still in race mode, I guess. And you're thinking, ah, you know, you always want to aim for the top three, but you finish as world champion. How was that emotionally to the process? Yeah, well, I think our radio communication uh, between Albi, my race engineer, and myself, I think really um kind of defined that because uh, my first initial reaction was um almost disappointment because i think we we did a, a really 
yeah, we did a really strong race. We effectively were fighting for the podium and then, yeah, through all the uh, mess and, and yeah, through all the, the, the fighting, we ended up uh, losing out on the podium. And I think that was my first initial reaction that I was disappointed not making it to P3 because I think we, in terms of pace, we, we deserved that in, in that race. Um, but uh, yeah, then I, there was, I think there was even a, a small, a small conversation between Albi and myself. And we were like, I think I said like, mate, I'm, I'm unhappy or I'm, I'm disappointed, cheer me up. And then he said, <laughs> oh, I'm the same, you know, I'm too much like you. And then we were both disappointed, but I guess at that point we also started to realize that we, we yeah, had to be very happy. And, and that kind of came when, um, yeah, I, I did my first interview uh, after jumping out of the car when I actually got a little bit emotional because ultimately no one ever takes this away from us and you know I uh, from the outside often things look easy um, but you know until until this point I had gone through um, good times bad times and you know everyone has their own story and everyone has their own journey and ultimately at that point I realized well in the past three years, I was allowed to win uh, Formula 2 and in my second season, Formula E. And yeah, there was a moment of small pride, which uh, yeah, resulted in a bit of uh, yeah, an emotional need. And a great thing because of all these successes, the roller coaster, the journey, having this series to, uh, you know, to cover your story. And all, many of your colleagues for the, um, the Formula E grid, um, when Formula E Unplugged was being made, of course, you know, we've been very lucky to attend various races um, and film different teams um, over the, the previous years of Formula E. How aware are you as racing drivers like how, that there was like a series being made? Because, of course, there's media everywhere from your own team to the broadcasters. Um, how does that was there any awareness that something like this was being made or was it just kind of like, oh, there's a camera and it's just following us? Uh, well, there is a bit of awareness because obviously we, we get briefed and informed uh, by Marlene's team. Um, but in all honesty, I, I don't care. So, <laughs> you know, I, I get informed, but I very quickly forget because, I, you know, I always focus on, on, on what matters to me and, and what is ultimately what, or what counts. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I've saw you, I've, I've seen, probably seen you around. I, I actually have no clue. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, nothing more than awareness, I would say. And I guess like, I mean, it's great because it, this series is going to help, you know, drivers, teams and Formula E build up awareness for, you know, the fans that want to get a closer piece of the action and, you know, help invite casuals to take part and understand more what goes into this awesome sport um for yourself um have you managed to see anything yet um are you kind of going to wait like the rest of us to see when it gets released on the 22nd of november um what can you tell us um about about unplugged yes um well i haven't seen anything of it yet uh so unfortunately uh or maybe fortunately it's going to be as exciting as for you uh, to watch it because obviously i will i will watch it um, and uh, I look forward to, yeah, look at it because uh, obviously F1 has their drive to survive. F2 used to uh, do something similar, uh, but on a smaller basis for, for the F1 kind of platform. Um, so it's, it's nice to have a kind of recap of, yeah, the season, especially when we were yeah, fortunate to win. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely looking for how many episodes are there? I believe it's 15, 15, 15 minute 15. episodes. Oh, wow. So there's a lot of great yeah. coverage for Formula E here, you know? It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, you know. Okay. And you can just watch it on YouTube? Yes, all on YouTube. So and when this is, is it so be released? On the 22nd. So I'm not too sure if it'll be released either weekly or, if, you know, like classic, like with series these days, you just get lumped everything. I would hope so that they would, you know, they would maybe do it weekly and that keeps the fans engaged because then they can watch other content in and around Formula E which is, of course, really important because, you know, we have the 2022 season coming up, lots of drama that's going to come, just like what happened in Valencia. I mean, reflecting on that, because that, you know, was the one race specifically for myself that I just couldn't believe at the time. Um, and even friends of mine who were casual um, to the world of Formula E were thinking, 
first off, come on, like Valencia, Spain, it's raining. How dare they? So you got the rain and then they all, all the drama of the energy. Reflecting back on that as your team, yourself and stuff, well, how insane was that to experience? Well, I, I, in, in hindsight, I, I almost would have liked to, to um, have been slightly less, slightly less uh, almost happy because I didn't realize what was going on. I mean, I, I, I was in my race. Uh, I think we started P7, P8, and I was basically from early on, early on in the race, we were running P2. So basically uh, for 80% of the race, we were uh, fighting with Antonio for, for the win. And he was doing his race, we were doing our race, and it was a bit of an energy management game. Um, but, you know, when, when we went into, when we entered the last lap, and obviously after the last safety car re restart, I saw the energy left on my on my dash and I saw the energy target I had for the last two remaining laps and that was extremely extremely low and I got instructed to really follow the, the software and follow the instructions from from the car to to respect it because that was that was the reality uh, and when we entered the last lap uh, yeah obviously I saw Antonio slowing down and I overtook him but I didn't realize um, everything that happened behind me. So in my eyes, we uh, basically won the race won instead the race. of finish, finishing second. And, and that was a great achievement because I was proud of how we achieved it. Now, in hindsight, obviously, seeing, ever, like seeing so many people uh, slowing down, maybe uh, it looked a bit silly being so happy. Um, but I, I honestly think that we as a team executed that very well. And... Obviously, there was a lot of criticisms, criticisms afterwards on uh, FIA organization, etc. But I kind of defend them because we as teams know the regulations and the organization didn't do anything that wasn't allowed or, or wasn't wrong or, or, or was wrong. So, of course, it was quite um, extreme to do that last energy and energy reduction. But ultimately, Tachita had their they had the, the, the race in their hands. If, if they would have restarted slower and, and they would have let the clock run out, then it would have been a, a one-lap race instead of a two-lap race. And, and I think majority of the people were caught out by, by that. And then when the race started, I think they couldn't believe that that was the energy uh, target for the last two remaining laps. And then, yeah, that was the, the result. But um, I, I have um, no hard feelings uh, to, towards that because I think we as a team uh, did, did right there. And I think that's what will make for, of course, you know, it's going to make great viewing, but also I think will allow, you know, again, like the casual fan or even fans, you know, just that are curious about Formula E will understand that this is what defines this sport. And of course, from what your Mercedes team did, what yourself did and how you, you kind of read that race and how you adapted that's what makes it exciting. That's what makes it different to other, you know, other classifications. So, um, nevertheless, um, looking forward, um, Nick, um, 2022, how do you feel about it? How do you think it's going to shape out? How are your personal predictions and goals? Um, well, obviously, this is a, a very common question that is asked prior to each uh, race event uh, by any journalist and and. Uh, I just didn't know what to reply uh, throughout the last season because it was too unpredictable and, and too random, in my opinion. Uh, but obviously, there will be changes done to the qualifying format, which I think is the, the first and biggest step towards uh, a more consistent championship. And I strongly believe that um, it will help in, in, um, in, in creating a more consistent uh, championship. So... I believe and I hope that fans will be able to understand it a little bit better and also um, be able to kind of support their, yeah, support their drivers or teams a bit more rather than seeing them, you know, winning and being last for three races or, or not scoring a point. So uh, I hope that in, in, in that sense, we become, um, yeah, more understandable and, and more interesting actually, because, you know, when you have 20 drivers uh, fighting for a championship, that is actually not so exciting because it will be the same going to, a, to the casino. 
um, but I believe uh, that will that will be improved for, for next season. So I do welcome yeah people to 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 watch us because I believe that the fight for the championship is going to become more interesting in in a way uh, sports uh, deserve. And this is the perfect thing about Formula E Unplugged. You know, we we get the perfect kind of taster to get everyone up to speed, to get excited for when we kick it off back in Saudi Arabia for 2022. Um, you know, 15 episodes, 15 minutes, you, you're going to be mad to miss out on it. Last thing I want to ask you, Nick, have you managed yet to have any, I mean, I've seen on, on the socials, you're very, very busy still. When does the downtime happen? Because the season's creeping up soon. Do you feel like you've had downtime? Are you going to have some downtime? What's good? What's going on? I definitely didn't have any, any downtime. <laughs> I had six days of holidays after um, Le Mans, so that was like two weeks. What? Yeah, like two weeks. Two weeks after um, Berlin, uh, but I probably spent five days on the phone uh, out of the out of the six. So I definitely didn't have any downtime yet, but it will come. Uh, and I hope to get my downtime from the 20th of December to hopefully uh, as long as possible into January before we uh, obviously start to prepare ourselves for uh, Saudi. And um, I will admit that I'm very much looking forward. I'm obviously very grateful for everything that I'm doing because I'm very happy um, being busy and, and doing a lot of different things and being involved with the Formula One team and because that is it, basically, you know, FE finishes, but then, you know, we, we switch our on. kind of focus a bit more towards um, F1 duties. Um, so, yeah, I hope to, to get some good time off over the winter and then uh, be ready and charged for, for the new season in 22. Well, Nick, it is certainly well deserved. We're very excited to see how your 2020 shapes up. We're excited to see how Formula E Unplug unravels. 15 episodes, 15 minute bite-sized clips. So you will, you know, very consumable for the fans and anyone that is curious about Formula E. And, you know, nevertheless, we just want to say thank you so much for your time. Um, and yes, enjoy your downtime. Thank you very much. And see you in a new season. <laughs>